Thank you for joining today. Uh, today's webinar will be on integrated final element certification. I'm Chris O'Brien. I work with um, work with Exida and I work with our customers in both 61508 and 61511 projects. And I've got a um, little over 30 years experience in the automation industry. What we're going to focus on today is looking at um, the need and the process to certify complete final elements. Uh, we, we've seen that the results in the field that people are getting from taking certified equipment doesn't always meet expectations. And so um, after some investigation and working with end users and OEMs, we've come up with a, a proposed path forward to try to take some of those, uh, eliminate some of those errors before they find their way into the field. A little bit of background on Exida. Uh, we pride ourselves as being a customer focused company. We really try to uh, align what we do with what the needs of our customers are. There are three main areas that we work in. The first is uh, enterprise tools or lifecycle tools. So we provide a, a, a suite of OEM tools and a suite of end user tools to really help people uh, properly apply and efficiently apply uh, the requirements of the safety life cycles. We are a, um, a NANSI accredited certified body. So we're a certification. We provide certifications and assessments. And we also provide uh, a suite of comprehensive lifecycle services for uh, our OEM and end user customers as well. We're a global company uh, with offices around the world. We work in diverse industries uh, from obviously process automation and um, with automation OEMs, but we also work in the energy field. We're very active in automotive applications and nuclear applications, uh, all around work that's related to high reliability, high availability systems. So that does all reinforce itself, um, but, that's, but we're pretty broad. We're a, we're a world leader in uh, functional safety certification. We've got um, Exeter by itself has done more uh, functional safety certifications than all the other companies combined. And even if we take a narrow look at safety logic solvers, we've got the largest market share of any certification body. We can see that a little better if we break down the other slice. You can see where Exeter is approaching 50% and the TUVs make up the balance. So we're quite proud of that. And I think it gives us a good insight. Our end user work and our OEM work uh, really reinforces each other because we understand both sides of the equation. I mentioned about our tools. Excellentia is a world-class tool um, that really has, a, we're very fortunate to have it used so broadly, but it provides uh, best of class individual tools and um, that integrate over an entire project and then you can actually move data through projects and through the enterprise. So if we look at this diagram we can you know somebody might just do a PHA or so selection tool or they might implement and do the whole project in it and it facilitates in backward and forward flowing um, information and tags about your project. Another thing that we're quite proud of is uh, the, the books we write and author. So we, you know, we try to capture what we think is best practice or even what's emerging practice in the field and get that down in books and publications. And uh, I think that's that's one of one of our key things we're proud about. So um, let's get to our topics for today. So. Our overall topic is certification of final elements. And to kind of go through that, we're going to, we're going to step through a few things. So first I'd like to review uh, what the uh, certification program is for type A products. So a type A product is uh, something where it's, you know, mechanical or electromechanical in nature. So type B products would be things with software. So we'll look at that. We'll look at some of the problems that end users and Exit has have observed with final elements in the field, even final elements uh, comprised of certified devices. And then we'll dig into and talk about what's needed for assessment of integrated final elements, what the steps are involved with to achieve that, uh, verification and validation planning, and then finally at the end we'll have some time for questions. 
So the normal certification process for type A products involves looking at sources of random failures and um, ways of mitigating systematic failures. So kind of key steps will be uh, document review, failure mode effect and diagnostic analysis, performing a site audit, creating a safety case, and doing a final assessment audit. And you can see through the flow chart, when we, we kind of branch at the beginning, this path is looking at the analysis of the random failures, and failure modes, and failure rates of the system. If it's a fairly straightforward device, such as a single valve or an actuator, we may not need to perform a failure modes effect analysis. We might be able just to go to the FMEDA. A failure mode effect analysis is useful if you've got a com more complex system, such as a wellhead trip system that might be using pipeline pressure um, and sensing that with a gap controller and having a, its own hydraulic reservoir and a tripping system to do that. So um, that might be an example where we would do an FMEA, but many cases when it's you know a single device, a solenoid, a valve, an actuator, we'll just go right to the FMEDA. On the process side, so not only do we have to know the numbers and have a good model for the random failure, modes, we need to understand and confirm that the process used to develop, manufacture, and maintain those certified devices meets the requirements of 61508. So that typically starts with a gap analysis and may require some specific training to raise the competency uh, of the OEM. But that first pass winds up in what's called a baseline safety case. Then as we go through the project and get the FMEDA information and some customer specific documents that may need to be written during the development process, such as a functional safety management plan, a device safety requirement spec, validation test planning and results, and a safety manual, they'll all go into what would be considered the final safety case. Once that's complete, we'll do an assessment audit if everything is met, we'll issue the certificates. If there's any anything found not to be up um, where it needs to be, we'll provide that feedback to the OEM. So that seems like a pretty robust process, but what's the problem? Well, what we're seeing is that the field data is showing the final elements, and as I mentioned, even final elements um, that are put together with certified products are not uh, providing the reliability that would be expected. A couple, there's multiple ways things have failed, but two very obvious ways are when there's insufficient torque from the actuator to move the valve to the safe state, or when there's excess torque so much so that it breaks parts, either the valve stems or bracketing and coupling uh, when parts are stressed beyond their yield strength. So these are, very apparent failures that we often get feedback on. And the question is, why are these weaknesses making it into, um, into the field? In addition to those types of failures, there's, there's also problems and concerns with incorrect documentation or failure rates that are just too optimistic, uh, things that would have a mean time between failure of 5 million years. Um, so this is just a snapshot of um, just a simple sample of much feedback, or we get a lot of feedback from customers um, on this, and questions about how can there be, you know, certified bodies putting out information that just doesn't seem right. When we kind of did the root cause analysis, we grouped it into four areas. So reliability criteria not being met, valve failing to move, a mechanical failure, or performance criteria not met. Any of these general categories could result in um, a dangerous design or a dangerous failure of the final element. So reliability criteria not being met could be um, invalid failure rates, implementing systems not per the safety manual, doing poor or no proof testing, or not maintaining the device. Performance criteria not being met uh, could be a function of the valve moving too slowly. It does move, but it doesn't move within the process safety time um, or the percentage of process safety time allocated to the valve or the leakage rates weren't met. 
And then again, the two points we talked about, you know, valve failures to move because the actuator is undersized, a material has built up that's causing an increase in torque, or if it's a dual acting application, a loss of utility such as pneumatics or hydraulics. And then finally, the mechanical failure, we could have a fatigue wear out, or we could also have um, exceeding the maximum strength of a coupling or a stem or a bracketry resulting in mechanical failure. So what we need to do is we need to really have a more holistic view of final elements and understand what's going on. So in looking at it, it became clear that requirements for final elements are not always sufficiently specified. The SIF safety requirement function doesn't go into enough detail to let somebody design and, and engineer the complete final element. <clears throat> Now, some people have been in some industry meetings, and some people have argued that this is a is a, a lacking or a gap in the coverage of 61.511 and 61.508, uh, saying that um, final elements aren't properly covered, and maybe we need an additional standard. I personally uh, don't agree with that, and I think you know, as Exeter, we don't really agree with that, because there is. And if we take a step back and say, let's treat this final element as a bespoke system. Uh, as opposed to just standard equipment off the shelf that could be put together in any way and uh, to achieve safety, we get a little bit different view. So from that, we'd say, well, let's take the safety requirement specification from the SIF level and let's go down and let's define the final elements requirements, do subsystem design, map those requirements down to specific devices, integrate it per a formal plan, have formal factory acceptance testing plans with criteria for pass or fail, and then push that information out to site integration and site acceptance testing, as well as operations and maintenance guidance. So I think that if we treat this as a, um, not really a custom system, but a, a special type that requires um, a little more guidance and a little more review, then we can use the current standards and and get well-designed final elements. So what we really want to do is we want to apply the classic V model, where we start on the upper left with the requirements, what needs to be achieved, um, have a concept of operations, define them in the requirements and architectures, do detailed design, implement it, and then integrate and test as we come up the right hand side. So if we map those steps we just talked about into a V model, you see we have a slightly, you know, uh, non-symmetrical V, and there's a reason for that that I'll, I'll get to. But you know, the final element SRS is going to be the top of the left hand part of the V. We're going to do this subsystem design, document device requirements, do device realization. Um, design device validation, integration, um, FAT, and in addition to FAT, provide information needed for proper SAT and operations and maintenance. Now, if we look at a classic um, device, a certified device such as a valve or an actuator, that really covers this part of the V. Now, if we're looking at a final element, we might have to look at multiple Vs because we need to confirm that, you know, each part is properly done. And then we're going to, when we get to the correct devices, when we get to integration, that's where we're going to have some additional requirements. But um, let, let's let's go on through a few more slides and then uh, see what that looks like. Oh, I need to erase the board. So what we're proposing is that a final element SRS be created. And what that final element SRS is going to do is it's going to bridge between the operational SRS or the SIF RS SRS, which says, here's what I need to do at a functional level or an operational level, and the individual devices that might have information such as binding or loss of drive for each component, but doesn't really roll it up. So we're going to, in the functional final element SRS, define functional failure modes, and define the requirements for the final element.
So if we start at the uh, 61511 SRS, their requirements are going to be high level and could include things such as the valve will close on trip, the valve will have a leakage of class three or less, and the valve will close within one second. Now, what we're saying is we're not saying that the SIF SRS doesn't have a lot of good information, but we're saying that it doesn't have complete information. But there certainly is information that should be drawn from that. So here's just a sample SRS, and uh, this is for a, um, a block and bleed valve assembly on, I think, on a boiler. What we're going to do is we're going to pull out what what we need to carry over. So we're going to have a close on trip valve. We're going to have a uh, class uh, leakage class of class four. Uh, final element needs to be fast enough so we meet the overall SIF safety time of 15 seconds. We want to design it to be de-energized to trip. We want the components to meet SIL 3. We want the proof test to be 12 months or longer. And we also want to meet NFP 85. So all these requirements um, are important and need to be carried forward. And the source of them would be the SIS SRS. But in addition to that, we're going to have to um, include steps to properly specify, design, and validate uh, the safety critical final element. So, you know, it might be really a combination of an SRS document and really a, a, a functional safety management plan for the final element, because we're going to call out um, or at least identify uh, how we are going to flow down the system sub-design, device requirements, integration requirements, and then testing, uh, you know, factory testing as well as site testing, and also operations and maintenance. So those are kind of... Um, the required steps. Beginning to look at them, so for final element subsystem design, we may have a straightforward system such as a, a standard valve actuator assembly with a solenoid mounted to it. In that case, you probably won't have to use uh, a more detailed design technique such as CHAS OPER FMEA to really understand what's going on. But as I mentioned, there, there could be things that are dual acting with a um, hydraulic power unit that really needs to be analyzed to understand the functional failure modes and how they will allocate down to the devices. So you may have to do um, a more thorough review of the system and to document it properly. But once you have that documented, we're going to move to device requirements. And again, as I mentioned, those devices really are going to be uh, individually mapped per V model, but we can kind of see how we could cascade the requirements down. So if we take a look at, um, you know, the top level is the block valve closes and vent valve opens, we're going to get a requirement for block valve one. And if this is a typical, you know, double block and bleed, there'll be a block valve two down here and there'll be a vent valve. But, you know, close block valve one, and let's assume this block valve is made up of the valve, a spring return actuator, a de-energized strip solenoid, a mounting bracket, and a coupling, then we're going to have requirements that we need to define and document for each of those components or devices that are required to make up the entire system. So for example, for the block valve, we might have leakage requirements. Uh, torque requirements, stem strength requirements. Uh, similar for the actuator, we're going to have torque output requirements. We're going to have um, a de-energized strip solenoid with a certain uh, CV required to be able to vent the actuator quickly enough. And then we're going to have the set of requirements for designing a properly engineered mounting bracket and coupling. So those requirements, we can see that one requirement such as um, close the valve should, not should, I mean, it, it does implicate multiple requirements beyond it, but those are not always uh, properly captured. So when we're thinking about this, if we think about the mechanical cert flow chart, we're going to have a project plan, product requirements, and if we're looking at an integrated devices, you know, each of those, in this case, we could have valve requirements, actuator requirements, solenoid requirements. 
We're going to have design requirements for each of those things, functional test requirements, and integration requirements. And anything going into that um, safety rated final element needs to have the same rigor that's applied when a, when a company gets their valve certified or their solenoid certified. Torque requirements are a key thing because they're it's relatively straightforward to get kind of a typical or baseline design torque requirements, torque requirements for the valve and torque output for the actuator. But torque can be affected by many things. So, so some can be design basis, which is friction, and others can be dynamic, uh, influenced by the pressure or flow going through the valve. Some are application dependent. Is it something, is it a lubricating fluid? Is it a fluid that has uh, particulates or or things come out of solution and tend to bind up on the stem? Could it be time dependent? Just the longer you don't move it, the stiction's increasing. And then um, are there integration torque requirements? So like misalignments due to integration and assembly that add to the overall torque requirement to move the um, valve to the safe spot. Then in addition, if we're looking at components such as uh, couplings or intermediate stems or bracketry, uh, they need to be designed properly. So yes, we need to size the actuator correctly, but we also need to design those parts that are going to be used uh, to put everything together. So they need to be strong and not break and rigid uh, so you get closure and you don't get misalignment. And then also a consideration is what type of diagnostics are going to be claimed for different type of components. Now we'll get into that a little bit when we're talking about proof testing and providing information for the further steps in the life cycle. So for device validation, we need to follow the same process called out for by 61508. So typically, uh, it would be highly recommended that if you're doing a final element that you need to be certified or that needs to be used in a safety system, that you're picking a certified valve, actuator, and solenoid. Now, there may be some components that need to be designed, such as bracketry. So you're going to follow the same steps um, with the same rigor as you would for a certified product. But frankly, most times those things are not certified but you do need to know the requirements for strength and rigidity. You need to design to them and you need to validate or verify through design analysis or testing that they, that they meet that. And then ultimately you need to validate at the top level, the entire final element does what it needs to. Then integration, to properly do integration, we're gonna need shop procedures and instructions, uh, proper fixturing, uh, detailed test plans with pass-fail criteria, and then they're going to need to be carried out by people who are trained and competent to do that. I want to touch a little bit on SIL verification. Now, you, it is possible to do the entire integration and not you know, assume that the customer has properly specified the devices and that when they're put together, they're going to give them the safety reliability they need. Uh, another fur, further or more thorough review would be actually performing that. Um, but whether it's done by the OEM or the valve integrator or the final user, it's important to include failure modes and failure rates for those uh, accessory devices and the, the coupling. So um, that's something we do see that, that a fair amount of time is overlooked. Also, important is in confirming that uh, if you're doing those calculations that appropriate failure rates are being used. So if you remember back to the beginning, one of the examples we gave was a customer providing feedback that the certificates seemed unreasonable and the failure rates were just too optimistic. So if you, you know, build a perfect or a near perfect final element, but you're using optimistic failure rates, you may just be uh, set up to fail from the start. So you want to make sure you're getting failure rates from um, credible sources, so thorough and valid field study failures. Uh, Exeter publishes a safety equipment reliability handbook, uh, or RITA has data. There's Exit FMEDAs, and then Exit has also put online a, a silsafedata.com, which is just a website to kind of just do a sanity check 
on uh, typical failure rates. So you can do a data check if you've got a device and you're a little bit suspect about what failure rates are being given, uh, you can look at it and, and check it. So I want to move on to another key factor, which is, now, now this is, you know, we talked about verification, and verification calculations. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the operations and maintenance phase. So something to consider in that point is what type of proof testing is done and what type of frequency, and are you going to do uh, any diagnostics? So. Exit has defined kind of five typical proof tests, everything from a partial valve stroke test to a full valve stroke test in operating conditions uh, with a leak test. And when you move between proof test one to proof test five, you're going to see different uh, degrees of proof test coverage, anything from high 50s to low 60s when you're in uh, proof test one, up to you know maybe 98% or better if you're doing proof test five. So the rigor or thoroughness of the proof test that's being implemented, along with the frequency, has a big impact on the overall uh, PFD average. So we really think that it's important that people start put, putting together proof test procedures for the entire final element. So right now, you can typically get, from the safety manual, proof tests for particular devices. But really what a customer needs to do is he needs to test that final element as it's assembled and have a realistic number. So we're really encouraging people to look at doing that and providing that information. So finally, like now finally, kind of like the last step probably before it leads um, the OEM or the integrator would be factory acceptance testing. And you know the importance of that should be pretty clear. But depending on you know how things are put together and the capability of the shops, you could have a, a an integrated final assembly, but have pretty dramatically different uh, capabilities. So on the right hand side, you might have an assembly that's integrated by the OEM and fully tested, and on the left hand side, you could have a you know a shop or depending on the conditions or, or tooling, you might not really be able to get things that well integrated or that well aligned. So that final testing of the integrated assembly is, a, um, is an important thing. I want to kind of migrate now to validation, and, uh, excuse me, verification and validation planning. Now, before we do that, we really, as we're looking at this and working with uh, OEMs, we're seeing kind of a two key characteristics and the, if we look at them creates a grid um, the first thing that we a first kind of key thing is is information about the process known so that's kind of over here now we've heard numbers to, such as you know, you know upwards of 90 percent of applications OEMs don't know, and the people that the OEMs are dealing with at the end users don't really have the application information. So what they can do is they can take typical torque requirements and typical torque outputs and make sure that that assembly is correct. And that would be basically you know, the, the typical design. A more thorough design would be um, taking application-specific information and being able to design that in with a safety factor. So maybe you have a lubricating fluid, or maybe you have a fluid that tends to build up and increase torque requirements. But knowing that will allow, will allow the final element designer to put a, a, a better system together. Then the other, the second variable is, is somebody providing um, no information and no cell verification or proof tests, or are they are is the integrator validating the cell verification for the equipment they've picked and providing a comprehensive proof test for the equipment they've picked? So we could see we've got you know grids one you know or spaces one through four, depending on which things um, which things are being included, and you know in reality this would be kind of the most rigorous and we should see um you know if we if we're looking at failure rates as we move this way 
we should be able to claim a, a, a better integrated system which is matched to the process and is provided with um, appropriate calculations and proof testing is going to see probably a somewhat lower failure rate than just um, a typically integrated uh, final element assembly. So that's kind of a, an important thing. So not only is it ensuring things are correct uh, when you get them, but it's also that they're actually is going to perform better. So we're trying to get away those problems that are causing these complete failures, and we can even get to a point where we've uh, where we're resulting in in somewhat better performance. For verification and uh, validation planning, we can look at our our steps that we've talked about, and then look at what methods uh, or re what the requirement is and what a sample verification and validation technique. So we've got our, our main steps, final element, safety requirement spec, final element subsystem design, device requirements, integration, factory acceptance testing, site integration and site acceptance testing, and operations and maintenance. So we start with the SRS. We're going to need to do a review. Typical techniques would include using a template and having an independent review. For the final element subsystem design, we'll do a design analysis, fits for youth study, still capability, review architectural constraints and PFD average. And we've got our, we're listing our typical techniques here. Device requirements, so this is just an example. This obviously would have to be created each time, but we're going to have performance requirements for each of the devices, and then we're going to look at the qualifications and certifications and information from the supplier. For integration, we're going to have assembly and functional testing. So we again, we need our work instructions and routings and test procedures. Factory acceptance testing, we're going to need our testing, our functional testing, and documentation review. So often these two points are, are linked in a factory when the things are built. And you'll see, you know, we're, they kind of repeat, um, but you might need additional requirements such as uh, material certifications uh, and documented uh, test plans and results. And then when that assembly is leaving a factory, we want to provide installation instructions, SAT test plans, proof test procedures, and recommended maintenance. Maintenance. So these last two steps are really confirming that the the plant or who's getting it has a good chance to. Um, maintain that over its entire life. So if we look at um, kind of what standard then would be applied, we'll see like if an OEM is getting their um, their integration certified, it's going to be typically an extension of a certificate they've already got for the valve and actuators they're building. And that would then go from just the you know, design and manufacturing of the devices to covering the integration process. For valve integrators, they would get their integration process uh, certified. Uh, end users would then would look at 61.511 for functional safety assessments and do you know the FSA three, uh, or could even do you know they could do an FSA two, a factory acceptance test, and an FSA three uh, after it's installed, but before the hazards there. Uh, in any of these cases, the requirements are going to be the same, and the, the traceability to the evidence is going to be the same. It's just that the you know the end user plant is going to be under 511, and the suppliers are going to be under 508. Now, this doesn't mean that there has to be a unique audit for every single valve actuator assembly. Uh, it's just similar to the way that valve families and device families can be certified. Um, a typical design could be done uh, and the process could be reviewed and confirmed that all the steps are being carried out that need to be carried out and then you know a family or a design basis certificate could be given for a family of uh, specific designs of valves and actuators in combination um, uh, again there can always be highly customized things that might need their own individual certificate um, and we do see that with like HIP systems and sub C systems, but for more general purpose valve actuator assemblies, uh, the design basis uh, will be able to be used. 
and I think um, and there's a you know we we did we talked about our books we re released released a second edition of Final Elements and Safety Systems and we've got uh, four ch chapters that are really applicable that cover safety verification calculations sources of failure data application considerations and uh, final elements is bespoke system. So that kind of covers a lot of what we just talked about. With that, I'd like to open it up for questions or comments. Okay, I see one comment about um, partial stroke testing and whether that's required. So partial stroke testing is is a is a way of doing a test, or it can, if it's automated, it could be done as a diagnostic. Uh, we've got a couple of webinars specifically on that, but there's not um, there's a requirement that proof tests be carried out uh, twice as frequently as the demand is expected, but there's not a specific requirement to do uh, partial valve stroke testing or to do it at a um, specific interval. That will come from your SIL verification calculations and your designing of the system. So if you're meeting your safety goals uh, without that, you don't have to do it. You, you may want to do it to um, extend the interval of your proof testing. And there's some evidence that if you're moving a safety valve that you know you don't let the, the stiction build up to a higher point. And in fact, it, it performs a little bit better, but uh, that all really goes into the system design and is not so much a requirement of the standard. So I'll see if there's any other questions. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions, but we will, this recording will be posted. I thank everybody for attending, and as always, please just send me, uh, send me or anybody at Exeta an email, and we'll be happy to uh, provide you all the assistance we can. And um, as I said, thank you, and have a great day.